People's Historian, the show where we read about half an hour out of a history book together. I'm Jason Kishinev. We are reading about robber barons and rebels. And if you enjoy what you hear, hit the like and subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when I make a new video. Let's dig right in, shall we? A different kind of challenge to the economic and social system was given by Edward Bellamy, a lawyer and writer from Western Massachusetts who wrote in simple, intriguing language a novel called Looking Backward, in which the author falls asleep and wakes up in the year 2000 to find a socialistic society in which people work and live cooperatively. Boy, was he wrong. <laughs> Looking backward, which describes socialism vividly, lovingly, sold a million copies in a few years, and over a hundred groups were organized around the country to try to make the dream come true. It seemed that despite the strenuous efforts of government, business, the church, the schools, to control their thinking, Millions of Americans were ready to consider harsh criticism of the existing system to contemplate other possible ways of living. They were helped in this by the great movements of workers and farmers that swept the country in the 1880s and 1890s. These movements went beyond the scattered strikes and tenant struggles of the period 1830 to 1877. They were nationwide movements, more threatening than before to the ruling elite, more dangerously suggestive. <clears throat> it was a time when revolutionary organizations existed in major American cities and revolutionary talk was in the air. In the 1880s and 1890s, immigrants were pouring in from Europe at a faster rate than before. There was no talk of a wall, though. They all went through the harrowing ocean voyage of the poor. Now there were not so many Irish and German immigrants as Italians, Russians, Jews, Greeks, people from Southern and Eastern Europe, even more alien to native-born Anglo-Saxons than the earlier newcomers. How the... <coughs> excuse me. How the immigration of different ethnic groups contributed to the fragmentation of the working class. How conflicts developed among groups facing the same difficult situations is, is shown in an article in a bohemian newspaper, Swornost, of February 27, 1880. A petition of 258 parents and guardians at the Throop School in New York, signed by over half the taxpayers of the school district, said, The petitioners have just as much right to request the teaching of Bohemian as have the German citizens to have German taught in the public schools. In opposition to this, Mr. Volker claims that there is a great deal of difference between Germans and Bohemians, or in other words, they are superior. End quote. The Irish, still recalling the hatred against them when they arrived, began to get jobs with the new political machines that wanted their vote. Those who became policemen encountered the new Jewish immigrants. On July 30th, 1902, New York's Jew Jewish community held a mass funeral for an important rabbi, and a riot took place, led by Irish who resented Jews coming into their neighborhood. 
The police force was dominantly Irish, and the official investigation of the riot indicated the police helped the rioters. It appears that charges of unprovoked... Oh, this is a quotation, excuse me. It appears that charges of unprovoked and most brutal clubbing have been made against policemen with the result that they were reprimanded or fined a day's pay and were yet retained upon the force. There was desperate economic competition among the newcomers. By 1880, Chinese immigrants brought in by the railroads to do the back-breaking labor at pitiful wages numbered 75,000 in California, almost one-tenth of the population. They became the objects of continuous violence. The novelist Bret Hart wrote an obituary for a Chinese man named Wan Li. Dead, my revered friends, dead. Stoned to death in the streets of San Francisco in the year of grace, 1869, by a mob of half-grown boys and Christian schoolchildren. In Rock Springs, Wyoming, in the summer of 1885, whites attacked 500 Chinese miners, massacring 28 of them in cold blood. The new immigrants became laborers, house painters, stone cutters, ditch diggers. They were often imported en masse by contractors. One Italian man, told he was going to Connecticut to work on the railroad, was instead taken to sulfate mines in the south where he and his fellows were watched over by armed guards in their barracks and in the mines given only enough money to pay for their railroad fare and tools, and very little to eat. Having my dinner. Kale and mango smoothie. It's better than it sounds. He and others decided to escape. They were captured at gunpoint, ordered to work or die. They still refused and were brought before a judge put in manacles and five months later five months after their arrival finally dismissed my comrades took the train for New York I had only one dollar and with this not knowing either the country or the language I had to walk to New York after 42 days I arrived in the city utterly exhausted <coughs> Their conditions led sometimes to rebellion. A contemporary observer told how some Italians who worked in a locality near Deal Lake, New Jersey, failing to receive their wages, captured the contractor and shut him up in the shanty, where he remained a prisoner until the county sheriff came with a posse to his rescue. <laughs> not funny. Funny, but not funny. <clears throat> A traffic in immigrant child laborers developed, either by contract with desperate parents in the home country or by kidnapping. The children were then supervised by padrones in a form of slavery, sometimes sent out as beggar musicians. Droves of them roamed the streets of New York and Philadelphia. As the immigrants became naturalized citizens, they were brought into the American two-party system, invited to be loyal to one party or the other. Their political energy thus siphoned into elections. An article in Natalia in November 1894 called for Italians to support the Republican Party. When American citizens of foreign birth refuse to ally themselves with the Republican Party, they make war upon their own welfare. The Republican Party stands for all that the people fight for in the old world. It is the champion of freedom, progress, order, and law. It is the steadfast foe of monarchical class rule. There were... Five and a half million immigrants in the 1880s, four million in the 1890s. 
creating a labor surplus that kept wages down. The immigrants were more comfortable, more helpless than native workers. They were culturally displaced, at odds with one another, therefore useful as strike breakers. Excuse me. Often their children worked, intensifying the problem of an oversized labor force and joblessness. In 1880, there were 1,118,000 children under 16, one out of six, at work in the United States. With everyone working long hours, families often became strangers to one another, not surprisingly. A pants presser named Morris Rosenfeld wrote a poem, My Boy, which became widely reprinted and recited. I have a little boy at home, a pretty little son. I think sometimes the world is mine, and him my only one. Ere dawn my labor drives me forth, tis night when I am free. A stranger am I to my child, and stranger my child to me. Women immigrants became servants, prostitutes, housewives, factory workers, and sometimes rebels. Leonora Barry was born in Ireland and brought to the United States. Brought to the United States? Didn't come to the United States. She was brought to the United States. She got married, and when her husband died, she went to work in a hosiery mill in upstate New York to support three young children earning 65 cents her first week. She joined the Knights of Labor, which had... 50,000 women members in 192 women's assemblies in 1886. She became master workman of her assembly of 927 women and was appointed to work for the Knights as a general investigator to go forth and educate her sister working women and the public generally as to their needs and necessities. She described the biggest problem of women workers through long years of endurance, they have acquired, as a sort of second nature, the habit of submission and acceptance without question of any terms offered them, with the pessimistic view of life in which they see no hope. Her report for the year 1888 showed 537 requests to help women organize, 100 cities and towns visited, 1,900 leaflets distributed. In 1884, women's assemblies of textile workers and hat makers went on strike. The following year in New York, cloak and shirt makers, men and women holding separate meetings but acting together, went on strike. The New York world called it a revolt for bread and butter. They won higher wages and shorter hours. That winter in Yonkers, a few women carpet weavers were fired for joining the Knights, and in the cold of February, 2,500 women walked out and picketed the mill. Only 700 of them were members of the Knights, but all the strikers soon joined. The police attacked the picket line and arrested them, but a jury found them not guilty. A great dinner was held by working people in New York to honor them, with 2,000 delegates from unions all over the city, the strike lasted six months, and the women won some of their demands, getting back their jobs, but without recognition of their union. What was astonishing in so many of these struggles was not that the strikers did not win all that they wanted, but that against such great odds, they dared to resist and were not destroyed. Perhaps it was the recognition that day-to-day -day combat was not enough, that fundamental change was needed, which stimulated the growth of revolutionary movements at the time. The Socialist Labor Party, formed in 1877, was tiny and torn by internal arguments, but it had some influence in organizing unions among foreign workers. <clears throat> in New York, G. 
Jewish socialists organized and put out a newspaper. In Chicago, German revolutionaries, along with native-born radicals like Albert Parsons, formed social revolutionary clubs. In 1883, an anarchist congress took place in Pittsburgh. It drew up a manifesto. <coughs> All laws are directed against the working people. Even the school serves only the purpose of furnishing the offspring of the wealthy with those qualities necessary to uphold their class domination. The children of the poor get scarcely a formal elementary training, and this too is mainly directed to such branches as tend to producing prejudices, arrogance, and servility. In short, want of sense. The church finally seeks to make complete idiots out of the mass and to make them forego the paradise on earth by promising a fictitious heaven. The capitalist press, on the other hand, takes care of the confusion of spirits in public life. The worker can therefore expect no help from any capitalistic party in their struggle against the existing system. They must achieve their liberation by their own efforts. As in foreign times, a privileged class never surrenders its tyranny. Neither can it be expected that the capitalists of this age will give up their rulership without being forced to do it. <clears throat> the manifesto asked, Equal rights for all without distinction to sex or race. It quoted the Communist Manifesto. Workmen of all lands unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. You have a world to win. In Chicago, the new International Working People's Association had 5,000 members, published newspapers in five languages, organized mass demonstrations and parades, and through its leadership in strikes, <clears throat> was a powerful influence in the 22 unions that made up the Central Labor Union of Chicago. There were differences in theory among all these revolutionary groups, but the theorists were often brought together by the practical needs of labor struggles, and there were many in the mid-1880s. In early 1886, the Texas and Pacific Railroad fired a leader of the District Assembly of the Knights of Labor, and this led to a strike which spread throughout the Southwest, tying up traffic as far as St. Louis and Kansas City. <coughs> nine young men, <coughs> nine young men recruited in... <coughs> Sorry, I got a frog in my throat. Ribbit. Wah. Wah. <laughs> Excuse me. Nine young men recruited in New Orleans as marshals brought to Texas to protect company property learned about the strike and quit their jobs, saying, As man to man, we could not justifiably go to work and take the bread out of our fellow workmen's mouths no matter how much we needed it ourselves. They were then arrested for defrauding the company by refusing to work and sentenced to three months in the Galveston County Jail. The strikers engaged in sabotage, a news dispatch from Atchison, Atchison Kansas. At 12.45 this morning, the men on guard at the Missouri Pacific Roundhouse were surprised by the appearance of 35 or 40 masked men. The guards were corralled in the oil room by a detachment of the visitors who stood guard with pistols. With the rest of them thoroughly disabled, 12 locomotives which stood in the stalls. Well, the rest of them thoroughly disabled, 12 locomotives which stood in the stalls. <coughs> In April, in East St. Louis, <clears throat> there was a battle between strikers and police. Seven working men were killed, and whereupon workers burned the freight depot, 
of the Louisville and Nashville. <clears throat> the governor declared martial law and sent in 700 National Guardsmen. With mass arrests, violent attacks by sheriffs and deputies, no support from the skilled, better paid workers of the railway brotherhoods, the strikers could not hold out. After seven, several months, they surrendered, and many of them were blacklisted. By the spring of 1886, the movement for an eight-hour day had grown. On May 1st, the American Federation of Labor, AFL, now five years old, called for nationwide strikes wherever the eight-hour day was refused. Terence Powderly, head of the Knights of Labor, opposed the strike, saying the employers and employees must first be educated on the eight-hour day, but assemblies of the Knights made plans to strike. The Grand Chief of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers opposed the eight-hour day, saying two hours less work means two hours more loafing around the corners and two hours more for drink. But railroad workers did not agree and supported the eight-hour movement. <clears throat> so, 350,000 workers in 11,562 establishments all over the country went out on strike. In Detroit, 11,000 workers marched in an eight-hour parade. In New York, said in Detroit, right? In Detroit. In New York, 25,000 formed a torchlight procession along Broadway, headed by 3,400 members of the Bakers Union. In Chicago, 40,000 struck and 45,000 were granted a shorter working day to prevent them from striking. Every railroad in Chicago stopped running and most of the industries in Chicago were paralyzed. The stockyards were closed down. A citizens committee of businessmen met daily to map strategy in Chicago. The state militia had been called out. The police were ready in the Chicago Mail on May 1st asked that Albert Parsons and August Spies Wow, really? August Spies <clears throat> the anarchist leaders of the International Working People's Association be watched. Keep them in view. Hold them personally responsible for any trouble that occurs. Make an example of them if trouble occurs. Under the leadership of Parsons and Spies, the Central Labor Union, with 22 unions, had adopted a fiery resolution in the fall of 1885. Be it resolved that we urgently call upon the wage-earning class to arm itself in order to be able to put forth against their exploiters such an argument which alone can be effective. Violence. And further be it resolved that notwithstanding that we can expect very little from the introduction of the eight-hour day, we firmly promise to assist our more backward brethren in this class struggle with all means and power at our disposal so long as they will continue to show an open and resolute front to our common oppressors, the aristocratic vagabonds and exploiters. Our war cry is death to the foes of the human race. Wow, that is fiery. <laughs> <coughs> On May 3rd, a series of events took place <clears throat> which were to put Parsons and spies in exactly the position that the Chicago Mail had suggested. Make an example of them if trouble occurs. That day, in front of the McCormick Harvest Works, where strikers and sympathizers fought scabs, the police fired into a crowd of strikers running from the scene, wounding many of them and killed four. Spies, enraged, went to the printing shop of the Arbeiter Zeitung and printed a circular in both English and German. 
revenge, working men to arms. You have for years endured the most abject humiliation. You have worked yourselves to death. Your children you have sacrificed to the factory lord. In short, you have been miserable and obedient slaves all these years. Why? To satisfy the insatiable greed, to fill the coffers of your lazy thieving master? When you ask them how to lessen your burdens, he sends his bloodhounds out to shoot you, kill you. To arms we call you, to arms! A meeting was called for Haymarket Square on the evening of May 4th. Somebody suggested I read a book about that in one of our future books. If you're listening, I'm paying attention. It'll be coming. A meeting was called for Haymarket Square on the evening of May 4th and about 3,000 persons assembled. It was a quiet meeting and as storm clouds gathered and the hour grew late, the crowd dwindled to a few hundred. A detachment of 180 policemen showed up, advanced on the speaker's platform, ordered the crowd to disperse. The speaker said the meeting was almost over. A bomb then exploded in the midst of the police, wounding 66 policemen, of whom seven later died. The police fired into the crowd, killing several people, wounding 200. With no evidence on who threw the bomb, the police arrested eight anarchist leaders in Chicago. The Chicago Journal said justice should be prompt in dealing with the arrested anarchists. The law regarding accessories to crime in this state is so plain that their trials will be short. Illinois law said that anyone inciting a murder was guilty of that murder. The evidence against the eight anarchists was their ideas. Their literature, none had been at Haymarket that day except Fielden, who was speaking when the bomb exploded. A jury found them all guilty, and they were sentenced to death. Their appeals were denied. The Supreme Court said it had no jurisdiction. What? The event aroused international excitement. Meetings took place in France. Holland, Russia, Italy, Spain. In London, a meeting of protest was sponsored by George Bernard Shaw, William Morris, and Peter Kropotkin, among others. Shaw had responded in his characteristic way to the turning down of an appeal by the eight members of the Illinois Supreme Court. If the world must lose eight of its people, it can better afford to lose the eight members of the Illinois Supreme Court. That was a terrible accent. I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. <laughs> a year after their trial, four of the convicted anarchists, Albert Parsons, a printer, August Spies, an upholsterer, Adolf Fisher, and George Engel, were hanged. Louis Ling, a 21-year-old carpenter, blew himself up in his cell by exploding a dynamite tube in his mouth. Oh! Three remained in prison. <coughs> the executions aroused people all over the country. There was a funeral march of 25,000 in Chicago. Some evidence came out that a man named Rudolf Schnaubelt, supposedly an anarchist, was actually an agent of the police. An agent provocateur hired to throw the bomb and thus enable the arrests of hundreds, the destruction of the revolutionary leadership in Chicago. But to this day, it has not been discovered who threw the bombs. While the immediate result was a suppression of the radical movement, the long-term effect was to keep alive the class anger of many, to inspire others, especially young people of that generation, to action in revolutionary causes. 60,000 signed petitions to the new governor of Illinois, John Peter Altgeld, who investigated the facts, denounced what had happened, 
and pardoned the three remaining prisoners. Year after year, all over the country, memorial meetings for the Haymarket martyrs were held. It is impossible to know the number of individuals whose political awakening, as with Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, longtime revolutionary stalwarts of the next generation, came from the Haymarket affair. And I think that's like the third or fourth chapter that I mentioned those names in. <coughs> Goldman and Berkman. As late as 1968, the Haymarket events were alive. In that year, a group of young radicals in Chicago blew up the monument that had been erected to the memory of the police who died in the explosion, and the trial of eight leaders of the anti-war movement in Chicago around that time evoked in the press, in meetings, and in literature the memory of the first Chicago 8 on trial for their ideas. After Haymarket, class conflict and violence continued with strikes, lockouts, blacklisting, the use of Pinkerton detectives and police to break strikes with force and courts to break them by law. During a strike of streetcar conductors on the 3rd Avenue line in New York a month after the Haymarket affair, Police charged a crowd of thousands using their clubs indiscriminately. The New York Sun reported, Men with broken scalps were crawling off in all directions. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you'll tune in for the next episode. Please do hit the like and subscribe button. And hit that notification bell because YouTube has been known to unsubscribe people. And then you'll get notified when I make a new video. Thank you very much again, and we'll see you.